sacred tradition precedes uh, sacred scripture as a source of divine revelation. And this is what I meant when I said in the beginning of the stream that it, it is the primary source of divine revelation. And so this is where I'm going to explain you know, what that really means to say, that it is a primary source of divine revelation, or the primary source. Um, and so a reason for it preceding sacred tradition is really quite evident in just the fact that um, Christ you know, did not command his apostles to write anything down. I mean, isn't that interesting? You know, you never see in the Gospels a command on part of Christ for his apostles to write anything down. Now, of course, we know that, you know, God did command that essentially by the very fact of divine inspiration, right? So the Holy Spirit was uh, you know, directly involved. He is the author of sacred scripture, and so he did bring about this divine inspiration. But Christ did not command his apostles to write anything down, at least so far as what's recorded in sacred scripture. He, he, to our knowledge, um, he didn't command to write anything down uh, in, in what would become the scriptures. Um, he did, however, many times in, in throughout the Gospels, commanded them to preach and to baptize. So he commanded his apostles to preach and to baptize, to... Uh, transmit all of the things that he had taught his apostles and, and, and to convey all of the mysteries that he had entrusted to them by way of oral preaching. Um, and this apostolic preaching, again, as per the words of Christ, would be afforded the Holy Spirit's divine assistance. Christ says that. He says, I will give you the spirit of truth and, and he, will, you know, he will lead you into all truth. He will send them the advocate, and the advocate will lead them into all truth. And um, and what, what we notice is that in the Pentecostal experience, um, by Pentecostal, by the way, I don't mean that crazy sect of holy rollers or whatever. I mean at Pentecost, um, the Holy Spirit uh, came upon the apostles and you know, notice what they did. They didn't start writing things down. They didn't start writing sacred scripture. That wouldn't come until much later. What did they start doing? They immediately began to preach. That's what they started to do. When the Holy Spirit had come upon them as a, as a nascent church. Um, and so... What we can understand from this is that the transmission of divine revelation proceeded by way of oral preaching and the faith of the church prior to its being put down to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Um, Holy, the, the preaching of the apostles, the preaching of the apostles, came prior to the apostles committing any of the divine revelation that they had received from Christ and from the Holy Spirit, uh, their, their preaching of it came prior to the writing of the sacred scriptures. And what that means is that Essentially, the sacred tradition is more primordial to what divine revelation is than sacred scripture is. In fact, without divine tradition, recognizing the divinely inspired canon of scripture itself in a way that is objective and not relativized to the you know, subjective uh, wits of the individual, would become impossible. Um... And so tradition really, or rather I should say scripture, emerges out of tradition. It emerges out of the Pentecostal experience of the church. It, it emerges out of uh, divine revelation received within the Christian community, within the apostolic community of the church. So the apostolic community of the church precedes the scriptures, and the scriptures emerge out of the 
Holy Spirit's indwelling within the church. And this is why St. Paul says very explicitly that he doesn't say the scriptures are the pillar and foundation of the church. Of the truth, He says the church is the pillar and the foundation of the church. He says that. Um, and you can see why. You can see why. Um, and so, so as I said, without divine tradition, therefore, um, you lose the the uh, causal foundation for the sacred scriptures themselves, and you also lose the ability to even recognize the sacred scriptures as canonical sacred scriptures. And this is a big problem for like, the Protestants. I know they have their own ways of attempting to deal with it, but really, I mean, I, I think the commonsensical position is that the open canon problem that they have is, I think, the biggest defeater for their sola scriptura position. So, um, this is especially true, by the way, when one considers the various controversies and ambiguities that emerged when the church is trying to recognize canonicity of certain scriptural books. And uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later on, but I do want to make mention of it. Um, so you have the whole controversy of you know the deuterocanonical books. Um, those are those, for example, and it's not just the seven books of the Old Testament, by the way, which I'll enumerate a little bit later, but it's not just those seven books. It is also, at least historically speaking, like the Catholic epistles, um, many of them at least, uh, elements, parts of uh, the book of Daniel, parts of the book of Esther. Um, it is e even, you know, the apocalypse of St. John. Um, so it's, it's that as well. And, you know, for that reason, for that reason, um, this creates a very big problem for anyone who doesn't recognize the church as, you know, an authoritative body that can clarify for us which of these books are canonical and which ones are not canonical. Um, so, now, that's not to say, by the way, that the church had no way of knowing, uh, you know, any the canonicity of any of the books, you know, there, there's this concept of the proto-canonical books, which are, which were never in dispute by anybody, right? Um, but, but you know, it is to say that uh, that th this was a matter of controversy and dispute um, in the early church and especially in the medieval church. Um, so, for example, you know. Like I said, it, it's not like uh, the church had no way of recognizing the canonicity of any of these books before, for example, the Council of Trent. You had the synods at Rome, Hippo, Carthage, and then you had uh, Pope Innocent the First, a letter from Pope Innocent the First. Um, he also, you know, you know, recognized explicitly the uh, the. Um, He, he recognized explicitly actually all of the books, like all, all of the deuterocanonical books. And this is like the 4th century and the 5th century. So you did have a very early ecclesiastical witness to these things. But these were local synods, and none of this was a matter of definitive church teaching at this time. And you had, like, some of the deuterocanonical books were in dispute by, for example, St. Jerome, um, although he did maintain it in his Latin translation of the scriptures in the Vulgate, so he did maintain it, but he didn't. He had doubts about the canonicity of some of these books. Uh, you have it uh, a lot more, you have this doubt creep in a lot in a lot in a more common way in the, um, among the medieval scholastics. In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure were some of the, like, 
few scholastics who did recognize the canonicity of all of those books. And so you have, and, and you know, that can maybe add to some degree of understandability for why the Protestants don't recognize them. But, but, um, that being said, uh, without an authoritative, you know, body, ecclesiastical body that can determine for us, that can, you know, recognize for us um, what books, what sacred books are, you know, canonical and which ones are not canonical, well then, you know, really you're just left to the private interpretation of the individual Christian. Now there are some attempts on part of the Protestants to um, explain away, you know, how it is that um, that that they can recognize, you know, the canon. So, so th there are some ways in which they attempt to do this, and really, they all fail. Like they're all, you know, quite embarrassing, actually. So one of the reasons, or one of the attempts that they give to explain how it is um, that they have this, uh, you know, method of recognizing the canon, and it's like the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. So the inner witness of the Holy Spirit is one um, way that they attempt to explain it. Another way that they attempt to explain it is, you know, just the perspicuity of scripture they, so they have this concept of, of the perspicuity of scripture that scripture can just you know speak for itself that, that there are intrinsic elements to the sacred scriptures and how they're written how, how how they move the human heart that you know just immediately upon hearing the scriptures um convey its canonicity to us or it's it's divinely inspired origin to us um, you know, this is all just, you know, flat out nonsense. I mean, I don't know how this is, this is clown talk. I mean, I don't know how anyone can really believe in that because, you know, first of all, sorry, but, you know, that has no ability to adjudicate this problem. That has no adjudic there's no ability to adjudicate a dispute about it. So what are you, what are you just going to say? That, um, that you know, if I recognize Tobit as scripture and you don't recognize Tobit as scripture, that you know the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and not me. Okay, well, well, by what, what, what can you appeal to outside of our, um, our our subjective experiences in order to adjudicate that problem? Is am I just not praying hard enough? Am I a sick person? Am I evil? Like, what what accounts for that? Um, and and so, that's a problem. That's a really big problem. They they don't really have a way of adjudicating that pro of, of adjudicating that question. Um, now we do. Now, really, the only counter argument they have is that it took us a long time to get there, like in terms of definitive church teaching, and that's true. Um, it, it is true. We have to admit as Catholics that a definitive we could say ex cathedra pronouncement on what precisely constituted the canon of Scripture did not. Uh, did not arrive until the Council of Trent. The Tridentine Canon is what definitively settled the matter, that those seven books, those seven deuterocanonical books, are truly part of the canon of the inspired word, written word of God. So, um, so yeah, that is true. But at least we have a, a method. Like, we have a method that is not just, you know, a, you know, a, a relativization of the inner witness of the Holy Spirit and that actually gets to something external, verifiable, objective, something that you can point to outside of yourself that can verify for us what is in and what's out. And it just seems to me that without this magisterial proximate rule of faith that can recognize that for us, then there really is no way to settle the problem of the open canon. Now, sure, they might look to um, 
various church fathers, they might look to the tradition of the church. They might look. They might even look to the fact that um, you know the, the, those seven books are included in the Septuagint. And by the way, the Septuagint really about I think upwards of eighty percent of uh, biblical quotations in the New Testament come from the Septuagint, which is you know the Greek translation of the Hellenized version of, of, of the scriptures, and it included all the deuterocanonical books. Um, and the Jews, many of the Jews, rejected that as, rejected those books as canon. But the church went with the Septuagint. And what you find is the apostolic fathers of the church, they quote the deuterocanonical books as though they're scripture. They make no distinction. Uh, you know, Clement of Rome does that. Polycarp does that. Irenaeus does that. So there really is no, uh, you know, there are, for example, good independent historical arguments for going with the deuterocanonical books as as canon. But I think more fundamentally, um, this problem, the, the, this the very existence of this controversy, lends credence to what we teach about the necessity for sacred tradition as a source of divine revelation and it also you know lends credence to the very existence of the magisterium as a way in which divine constitutive sacred tradition can be recognized as such so you know a great example of you know a a, a element of divine revelation that is not contained explicitly in sacred scripture are what books of the bible that we consider sacred scripture um, scripture doesn't tell that scripture cannot you know speak in this self-conscious way about itself such that such as to give us certainty about which books are canonical and which ones aren't that's that's simply not conveyed in scripture and absent that um, we have to turn to a source of divine revelation that is distinct really distinct from scripture um, and that would be divine tradition that would be divine tradition and uh, and its attestation by way of the magisterium of the church, and so so that's really my my main argument. I would say um, against the sola scriptura concept that the, that the Protestants have. Um, so uh, I mean, just for the sake of your you know for for to be informative, I'll, I'll go through like what those deuterocanonical books are. So in the Old Testament. Um, You have well actually I'm gonna go through that later yeah I'm gonna go through that a little bit later um, but uh, but yeah I mean you know yeah it's it, so in the Old Testament for example you have um, I, I guess I could go through it now actually um, Although I, I probably will go through that in more detail when I just talk about sacred scripture. So I think that suffices the issue for now. Because um, this is really just to make a point about sacred tradition. Um, okay. So. Uh, do. So divine revelation, therefore, to kind of wrap up what we are, you know, talking about there. Divine revelation, we would say, is primarily transmitted and secondarily written. So, in terms of how tradition works, divine revelation is is transmitted primarily, and then secondarily, it's written down. It's transmitted through the constitutive divine tradition of the church, through the oral preaching of the apostles, and then that is the primary source of divine revelation and then it is put to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in sacred scripture and so I'm just going to say a couple more words about sola scriptura and then we will talk about the magisterium in a little bit more detail because we do want to cover the whole of tradition and the magisterium is as we said 
um, the main organ of the of whereby uh, tradition, sacred divine tradition, is recognized as such. Um, so, because this constitutive tradition is a source of divine revelation and an infallible rule of that, it would therefore follow that sacred scripture is not the only infallible rule of faith. Remember, the Protestant concept of sola scriptura um, doesn't so much say that you know scripture is is all you go by, because they many of them do recognize the value and the various criteria of tradition that we've talked about. So they'll read the fathers, they'll read the councils, the early councils at least. Um, they'll even draw inspiration from, you know, various post-patristic and medieval commentators like St. Thomas Aquinas. Some of them will actually draw value from reading St. Thomas. Um, but the point is they believe that scripture is the only infallible rule of faith. And we've kind of gone over why that doesn't make sense. But I want to add some scriptural support to that. And um, I've already quoted these passages, but you know I'll quote them again and, and say a little bit more about them. So um, this is one thing that St. Paul says, and again, that 1 Corinthians 15 uh, passage, where he says, Whether then it was I or they, namely the apostles, so we preach and so you believe. If Christ has not been raised and our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So think about the order of progression that he's getting at here. First we preach and then you believe. So there's a a divine authority that he is attaching to apostolic preaching. And if apostolic preaching has behind it divine authority, then that follows that apostolic preaching by virtue of itself is infallible. It's protected from error. And if it's protected from error, the apostolic preaching itself that is a form of divine revelation. That's God revealing himself to us. And if it's God revealing himself to us through apostolic preaching, then that means that divine tradition that is transmitted by way of oral preaching and not so much by way of written inspired word is a constitutive element of what divine revelation is. And so that's Paul. Paul also goes on in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I, and I've already quoted this one. He says, I delivered to you what I also received. I preached to you the gospel which you have received. So again, uh, think again to this order of progression. It starts with preaching, and then that preaching commands belief. We would say um, that word belief is actually very important in itself. Belief, you know, we only use the word belief in reference to faith, to the deposit of faith. In fact, that's a theological note of certitude that the church has, has where uh, it's divine revelation that we respond with the ascent of faith or belief. Um, for example, when the Pope in like an encyclical or something teaches something for us, when he exercises his magisterial authority in a non-definitive way, um, the response that we give is what we would say, you know, religious submission of intellect and will. That is not the same thing as belief in the same way that I would say I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, etc. That concept of belief is, is relegated to divine revelation itself. And divine revelation that is also... Uh, codified in the church's magisterium infallible, infallibly, we would say we, we assent to those things with divine and Catholic faith. And so that is this area of belief. And so St. Paul, when he says that I delivered to you what I received and I preached to you the gospel which you have received, so we preach and so you have believed, what he is saying is that apostolic preaching demands the very kind of assent that you give to divine revelation. And so, again, divine tradition, divine constitutive tradition is a real source of divine revelation here, and it is St. Paul attests to that. And again, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, he says, Hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter. So again, those are those two categories by which um, divine revelation is transmitted. So some patristic support. I want to give some, you know, some 
room for the fathers of the church to uh, lend support. Now, there are a lot more that passages from the fathers that we could go into, but you know, I just wanted to list a couple here for, for the sake of brevity. So St. Irenaeus, he says, The church, having received this preaching and this faith, although scattered throughout the whole world, yet as if occupying one house, carefully preserves it. So he's attesting here to the preservative dimension, well, both to the constitutive and the preservative dimension of a divine tradition. He goes on, She also believes those points of doctrine just as if she had one soul and one in the same heart, and she proclaims them and teaches them and hands them down with perfect harmony as if she possessed one mouth. So St. Irenaeus, he's saying that divine revelation comes to us by way of not just apostolic preaching, but also the preaching of the whole church. So it's the faith of the universal church as well that we can consider is truly a source of divine revelation. Because when the church receives divine revelation within her, um, that divine revelation that, that, that she receives is given by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the principle whereby the church is one and whereby the church acts as one. So uh, the church herself is, by virtue of the Holy Spirit's indwelling within her, a witness a, a divinely instituted witness to that divine sacred tradition that is itself a source of divine revelation. And this is what St. Irenaeus accepts. We'll move on to St. And St. Irenaeus, by the way, a very early father. I'm sure all of you know he's a very early, very early, you know, second century father. So, um, St. Augustine, he says, Although it may not be proved by any reason or explained by words, nevertheless it is true that since ancient times it is preached with true Catholic faith and is believed throughout the whole church. And so, um, obviously, here he is referring to you know, elements of the deposit of faith that are not explained so much by words so maybe they're not straightforwardly and explicitly spelled out in the scriptures nevertheless it's preached since ancient times by the church and believed throughout the whole church so he's pointing to these criteria of tradition whereby the unwritten source of divine revelation is um is testified to. St. John Chrysostom. St. John Chrysostom says that it is therefore clear that the apostles did not teach everything in epistolary form, so in the form of their letters, um, but that they taught many things besides in unwritten form, and these things too are worthy of acceptance. Wherefore, we should consider the tradition of the church as worthy of belief. So he is pointing to the unwritten source of divine revelation as transmitted through the oral preaching of the apostles. Again, that's that constitutive element of divine tradition. Um, that is, as per St. John Chrysostom, worthy of belief. It's, it's, it's again, um, worthy of belief. That word belief, we only... We only exercise belief understood in the sense we only truly exercise belief in response to divine revelation we don't exercise belief in response merely to an authoritative teaching of the church that we owe submission to that we owe submission but we don't owe you know, divine and catholic the assent of divine and catholic faith necessarily unless that authoritative teaching is conveying something that is itself attested to by the church infallibly as a dogma to be believed. And what are dogmas to be believed? Well, those pertain directly to divine revelation. This is the primary object of infallibility. Um, 
And so you have this patristic recognition of a source of divine revelation that truly is distinct from, meaningfully distinct from, sacred scripture. Now, there is a debate within the church, there's a debate among Catholics, about the degree to which um, divine revelation that is transmitted by way of sacred tradition uh, truly can be considered independent of the sacred scriptures. And so some of the church will hold to this material sufficiency view where anything that is any element of divine revelation that is transmitted by way of sacred tradition is at the very least going to be implied by what is in scripture. And so on that basis, they would say that, you know, scripture is, there is a certain degree to which scripture is sufficient within itself to transmit divine revelation. But they would say that, you know, it's a material sufficiency. So it, it's, it's not as if, um, Scripture alone is sufficient in its explicit letter in transmitting the fullness of divine revelation. Um, now, there's another view that would say that, um, no, divine tradition, there is an element to divine tradition that transmits parts of divine revelation that are just not in Scripture. My own view is sort of a synthesis of these two, where I would say that um, anything that divine tradition conveys to us as a source of divine revelation is at the very least, perhaps if not directly implied by Scripture, is going to bear some integral connection to Scripture in some way. So, for example, um, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin. I don't think you could really say that the assumption of the Blessed Virgin is like directly implied by the sacred authors. Uh, you can make a good typological argument from the Old Testament, so in that sense I think you can. But, but I think the relationship between like the dogma of the assumption and sacred scripture is more of an integral connection in taking the, the data that you have in Scripture and when you harmonize it together, you get um, an opening that is filled perfectly by the dogma of the Assumption. Um, so the dogma of the Assumption fulfills what Scripture hints at but fundamentally leaves open to be filled by this dimension of divine tradition um, and and so so that's what uh, that's one example that I would that I would point to yes I think you can argue that you know it is implied by the Immaculate Conception and the Immaculate Conception is more directly implied from sacred scripture but but again I think it's more of an integral connection and so so I would say that you know there is very much a meaningful distinction between the divine revelation that's transmitted through sacred tradition and the divine revelation that's transmitted through sacred scripture. Um, um, so, so yeah, that, that, well, that's what I, so that's what I would say about that. Now, um, sacred tradition, again, getting at its uh, preservative dimension of sacred tradition, um, as we said, it is preserved by the magisterium of the church, by the teaching authority of the Catholic Church. The teaching authority of the church is what gives us the ability to recognize divine tradition for what it is. Um, and through the magisterium, so through the teaching authority of the church that is embodied by the Pope and the bishops in union with him, not only the divine revelation contained in sacred tradition, but also the divine revelation that's contained in sacred scripture is preserved and safeguarded from corruption by the church under the charism of infallibility. So Christ gives the church and trusts the church with the share in his authority that enables the church with one infallible voice, and getting at what St. Irenaeus said, uh, with, with, with the unity that the church possesses as her own, the one faith, 
um, and as such is given the charism whereby she can recognize that one faith. You know, this is, I think, the most sensible way to interpret what Jesus says in the Gospels, where Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Well, if you don't interpret that corporately, if you don't interpret that as the church, as an institutional body, as a as a corporately one and unified mystical body of Christ, um, receiving this charism of infallibility whereby she can hear the voice of the shepherd, um, then again, it's relativized. Like, oh, there's no way to adjudicate between me and another person which one of us is, is hearing the voice of the shepherd, which one of us is a true sheep, you know? So, um, so th this is why the charism of infallibility is so very important. The charism of infallibility enables the sheep of Christ, enables the church of Christ, the bride of Christ, to truly act as one, to act and to exercise itself in a, in a discernibly unified fashion, in a unified manner, um, so that the sheep, the, f the, the flock of Christ, it's truly, you know, intelligibly one flock of Christ. The unity whereby the flock is one flock is not a mere metaphor. It would be more metaphorical, that unity, if the church had no way to, you know, act as one in an objectively identifiable way. And that's done uniquely through the magisterium of the church. The magisterium enables the church to act as one. And without the magisterium, the church cannot really act as one. Um, and of course, the papacy enables the church to act as one with much more ease. Because the, the, the pope, the papacy, gives the church this principle of unity whereby she can truly act as one and exercise her authority as one body of Christ. Um, Yes, it is true that, you know, the Orthodox, um, they can point to some ecumenical councils, but, um, you know, there's a, there's a reason why they have a hard time convening another one, right? I mean, what's getting in the way of the Orthodox convening another ecumenical council? Well, it's because they lack this principle of unity that is guaranteed by the papacy. And that's why... The papacy, or rather, that's why the church has been able, the Catholic Church has been able to convene, you know, 21 ecumenical councils. And the most recent one was, you know, in terms of church history, not very long ago. It was like yesterday. Um, and so the papacy enables the church to uh, be a living witness to the divine tradition of the church, and, and you know, to the divine revelation of the church, and to recognize what is authentically uh, belonging to the divine tradition of the church. Um, and, and the papacy enables the church to exercise that power frequently and actively and continuously throughout her history. And so that's just you know one little plug for the papacy within that. Um, so it's just I want to just very quickly, kind of very briefly explain, and we'll get into this in a lot more detail when we cover the church, um, but I want to explain a little bit about the magisterium. I want to talk a little bit about what the magisterium is because, you know, the magisterium is, as we've been saying, um, integral to the preservative dimension of sacred tradition. It's a real aspect of sacred tradition. And um, so what is the magisterium? Well, it's important to recognize that the magisterium as such, the teaching authority of the, the teaching office of the church as such, is a servant to the word of God. Or to the deposit of faith. So the mag you cannot conflate, per se, the magisterium of the church with the deposit of faith. And you can't conflate it, per se, with scripture and tradition. That's why within tradition we have that distinction between, you know, constitutive and preservative. Constitutive, you know, by virtue of what it means, what would the word constitutive means, it's what actually does comprise, it's the makeup of sacred tradition in as much as we consider it a source of divine revelation. And the preservative element of it 
is, is more extrinsic to what it is in its essential nature, in its essential substance. It's what can recognize the constitutive element of sacred tradition. So it's what can actually recognize what sacred tradition adds to divine revelation. Because there's no more divine revelation after the death of the last apostle. So the magisterium does not, um, does not add to divine revelation. There's no more public revelation after the death of St. John. And uh, I just want to say congratulations to uh, Huckleberry Doc in the chat. He says he converted last Easter. That's that's awesome. That's 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 really awesome to hear, man. That's what we want. That's what we want. So glad to hear that the Spirit has been working within you. Um. So, um, to bolster that point I just made, let's quote briefly from. Vatican one. So Vatican one says, for the Holy Spirit was promised to the successors of Peter, this applies to the whole magisterium as well, not so much that or not so that they might by his revelation make known some new doctrine, but that by his assistance they might religiously guard and faithfully expound the revelation or deposit of faith transmitted by the apostles. So again, um, this divine revelation precedes the magisterium. The magisterium is a servant of divine revelation. Um, and it's the magisterium that is, as our proximate rule of faith, what enables us to recognize divine revelation. Again, it's what recognizes, or what rather, it's what enables the sheep to recognize the voice of the shepherd. Um, and so there are two primary organs of the magisterium. And, you know, and we're going to talk a lot more about this in a future stream, but, um, you know, because this, this is a lot of, um, this can really cause a lot of confusion, right? Uh, about, you know, the difference between the extraordinary and the ordinary magisterium, what that really means. Because um, there are a lot of different ways in which Catholics try to interpret those concepts. But I think the best way to categorize the magisterium um, is to distinguish it essentially between the authentic magisterium and the definitive magisterium. So by authentic, we really just mean authoritative. So it's the magisterium that carries with it a non-definitive note of authority. So it's essentially the regular teaching office of the Pope alone, of the Pope and bishops uh, in union with the Pope. right? So, so the Pope alone, or the Pope and the bishops who are in union with the Pope. And the response on part of the faithful that is owed to this organ of the magisterium is, as I said a little bit earlier, um, the religious submission of intellect and will. But not necessarily, it's not necessarily infallible. So um, examples of now when I say examples I'm going to qualify that in a minute but examples of this are typically encyclical letters apostolic letters apostolic exhortations etc now there's a qualification to be had there because the Pope can speak infallibly within these mediums within these you know channels of papal communication and he has in the past um, but the, those are kind of rare instances, and usually what is expounded in these papal writings are um, non-definitive magisterium. And so it's just the regular teaching office of the Pope. So the Pope has this office of teacher, of universal teacher of all Christians, and most of the time he doesn't exercise the charism of infallibility, but we do owe religious submission of intellect and will to this category of magisterial uh, teaching. And uh, I, I see, you know, some people have sent questions so far. Maybe one of them is about, <laughs> like, what do we do in a situation where we might uh, have to withhold assent to magisterial teaching? So if that's one of the questions, I'd be happy to answer that, but I, I don't have time to get into that in this current monologue um uh, but i do have a lot to say on it so uh, so that's the authentic or the authoritative magisterium and, and so that's one organ of the magisterium there is also the definitive or the extraordinary we would say organ of the magisterium and uh this is the teaching of the authority or this is the teaching teachings of the magisterium again of the pope alone or the pope and bishops in union with him and that the latter of those would basically primarily be exemplified through an ecumenical council. Um, but this would be referred to those teachings of the magisterium 
that are infallible and guaranteed by their very exercise protection by the Holy Spirit. So Vatican I is very clear that whensoever various conditions are met, the Holy Spirit guarantees his divine protection of those teachings from any stain of error whatsoever. And so what are those conditions? Well, it has to be on a matter of faith or morals. So the Pope has no authority whatsoever to, uh, you know, force you to believe that, um, I don't know, uh, you should eat three meals a day or that like breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Like the Pope has no authority to speak on those issues. Um, I mean, he can have opinions about it, but he, but he has no authority and he has no divine assistance that can guarantee that those teachings are going to be protected from error. A perfect example of this would be like in Laudato Si, uh, in Pope Francis's uh, encyclical letter on that. Now, this is none of what he says in there is like definitive, but 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 what is said here in, in, with respect to this first condition for papal infallibility also applies to recognizing a a merely authoritative teaching of the magisterium. So in order for a teaching of the magisterium to be authoritative, it has to pertain to faith and morals as well. Um, so like in Laudato Si, he talks about climate change. Now, you don't have to accept the contingent matters of fact that he proposes as true that do not pertain to matters of faith and morals. But you do have to accept the moral teaching. So like on the conditional uh, on the condition that climate change is really happening in the way he's saying, yeah, there would be some moral obligations that are that would be attached to that empirical uh, fact. Now, whether that is an empirical fact, I mean, he doesn't have any expertise in that necessarily. So, um, but as a conditional, yeah, like if it is true, if it is happening the way he says it's happening, then the moral principles that he is uh, articulating um, carry with it an authoritative degree of weight. Uh, now, uh, so, so that's the first condition for an infallible statement. The second condition is that, be that it would have to be taught to the whole church. Now, this doesn't have to be in a super explicit way. Like, the Pope doesn't have to say, like, I am hereby speaking to the whole universal church. But, I mean, it has to be, basically, he has to be speaking as Pope. He has to be speaking in an official capacity such that it is, it is evident, it is obvious that, that it's meant ultimately for the whole church. A good example of maybe an ambiguous... Um, instance of this would be uh, Innocent III's uh, Professio Fide to the Waldensians. Now, professions of faith are good examples, especially in the medieval period, because they're like directed to a specific person, essentially. like In order to have communion with the church, you have to agree to these propositions, right? Now, implicit in that, though, is that for any Catholic to be Catholic, they would have to agree to what is contained in the profession of faith. So that's an example where like, it may not be as explicitly stated, but it is nevertheless um, recognizable that it is taught to the whole church. So that's the second condition. The third condition is that there has to be a manifest intention on part, on part of the Pope to bind the whole faithful to this teaching. That has to be manifest. That has to be pretty clear. So um, the most recent example of this in my opinion, some people disagree, but I think it's pretty obvious, is Pope Francis, or not Pope Francis, uh, Pope John Paul II's um, teaching that, you know, women can't be ordained to the priesthood. He says in Ordinatio, Sacro, in Ordinatio Sacerdotalis, um, after he gets done saying that the church has no authority to confer priestly orders on women, he says, well, to preface that, first of all, he says, by virtue of my supreme apostolic authority, I hereby declare. So that's already, we're entering into, like, we've already, you know, covered the bases of, you know, he's invoking his authority, he's teaching it to the, the whole church, um, and, and, and then he says, after he enunciates the teaching, he says, and this is to be definitively held by all the faithful. So you can see how that checks all of the boxes. And so whensoever a pope meets those criteria, we can be assured that the Holy Spirit will protect him from all error. Now, there are some Catholics who think that this has only happened twice. I think that's insane. That is an insane position if you believe that. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know what you're thinking because like, if that's true, that it's only been exercised twice in like the 19th and 20th centuries, then what have we as a church been doing for like 2,000 years, right? Um, so, so I think that's that's a silly position. I think you can point to like maybe like even tw as, as many as 20 instances 
of papal infallibility being exercised. And we'll talk about that in a lot more depth in the future when we really cover papal infallibility. But that, that's not so much the, the scope of this stream. But I did want to address elements of that. Okay, so that's, that's tradition. So I think we've covered this concept of tradition pretty uh, thoroughly, pretty thoroughly.